Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 22nd day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. Hmm. Is Thanksgiving actually on the 23rd? Yes, it is. That is very early this year. Um, did you know that next year Hanukkah and Christmas are on the same day? Somebody's going to make that a sign of the end of the age or something. It's obviously a sign from God that the Jews are going to all convert to Christ next year. But it's, it's, it's interesting because Hanukkah is not a biblical holiday. But what it is, it's a, a remembrance of the cleansing of the temple under uh, the Maccabees, they had, the, the Greeks had desecrated the temple, and the Maccabees uh, uh, had cleansed it, and they had relit the, the uh, menorah lamp, but they didn't have enough sacred, you know, the proper oil to keep it going very long, so miraculously, supposedly, it kept going for seven days or something like that without being refilled. But it's it's an interesting... Uh, uh, I don't know if I necessarily believe that miracle. <laughs> it's possible, but uh, everything's possible for God, but God does not do some things. <laughs> well, no, everything is not possible for God, and I want to talk about that. But it's just... It, I happened to run across that. I was looking, well, what you, uh, because of the events in... Uh, Palestine uh, on October 6th and 7th and how that was related to the, the week prior to the 7th was Sukkot and Israel, the, the state of Israel there was deliberately provoking the, the Muslims by uh, invading, repeatedly invading with large numbers of people the Temple Mount during Sukkot because uh, the law of Moses, which they do not keep at all, <laughs> you, you cannot keep the law of Moses. Uh, even if the temple was there, you couldn't keep it. But uh, And also, you cannot just, just anyone cannot just go rebuild the temple. They tried that once in the 200s, I believe, and things like flames and earthquakes prevented them from it happening, <laughs> erupting from the ground. Um Think, I think God was dis, disapproved of their adventure, or venture. Yeah, it didn't work. But uh, so this current administration, you know, I, I was unaware of this. I hadn't been following since I abandoned dispensationalism. Um, I hadn't been following. That doesn't mean I embrace certain other things. So <laughs> I embrace the scriptures and Christ Himself. Uh, but what does the scripture teach? That's you know. I, if it doesn't, if it's not taught, if it's not taught in the scriptures, I don't have to believe it. <laughs> there are some things mentioned in the scriptures I don't have to believe either. Uh, there is there is a, a stupidity among Christians. I don't know why this is that people that know better, you know, they have the the doctrine of uh, I don't know. I, I'm not going to affirm this doctrine necessarily. Because it's, it comes from men. It doesn't. The scripture does not say this, but the verbal and plenary inspiration of scripture. Well, first of all, you have to define scripture, and the Bible doesn't have a list of canon. Doesn't know how to have a specific canon of scripture. So, hmm, that's, so that that shows up several hundred years later. Uh, basic, it, 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 they're accepted by the Christian community over a period of time. Some are immediately accepted, others are a little later, uh, especially if the author was not an apostle. Uh, the book of Hebrews was slow to accept. Uh, I think James was slow, probably. But the book of Revelation was slow. Of course, that was probably the last book written, and it takes a while to, to circulate it, too. So if it was written on Patmos, uh, <laughs> yeah, it would take, you know, would distribute, uh, it would spread, first of all, among the communities there and then down. And because of the content, it, it was the most unpopular 
book in the New Testament to copy. I believe it's thoroughly inspired, but it's simply because of the content and because of it was the last, it, its acceptance in the entire Christian community was a little bit slow. So that's what canonicity is. It's just acceptance by the Christians. There's no official canon. <laughs> Nobody, God didn't send down a list of books. And uh, it was in, the other interesting thing, most Christians don't know, most Protestants or uh, fundamentalists or evangelicals don't know, is that the King James actually included the Apocrypha up well into, what, into the 19th century. <laughs> Why? I think eventually uh, the reason it stopped was uh, the printing industry. They probably would could save money by putting not printing those books. There are some books in there in the Apocrypha, the, the Maccabees, because they uh, are historic books. <laughs> and... Uh, if you have, if you read the Maccabees, you realize that a lot of the things that Daniel prophesied were actually fulfilled, very accurately. So, but uh, dispensationalists, since their Bibles didn't have the Maccabees, uh, those uh, what three, three uh, short books, and they're filled with all kinds of nonsense too. But. Uh, uh, they they were his, well they're historic uh, historic uh, uh, about that particular time period. And some of the other books are nonsense, Bell and the Dragon and nonsense like that. But uh, uh, yes, if you read those, you realize, huh, a lot of what Daniel said there about the King of the North and the King of the South and all that, yeah, you know, was already fulfilled. But uh, these dispensationalists, because their Bibles didn't have that, and they worked pretty much exclusively with the King James. Uh. <laughs> well, ignorance produces ignorant doctrines. Uh, but the uh, what was I, where was I going with that one? Oh, yeah, the coincidence between Hanukkah and Christmas. But it, there was a Sukkot, the the Gaza thing. It's oh Lord. What a mess. Talk about the, uh, a manifestation of the sinfulness of humanity. In this case, it, it really exposes the absolute sinfulness and wickedness of the, the, of the state of Israel. Um, not every individual, but yikes. How wicked can you be, the genocidal maniacs over there? Just what they're doing is they're eliminating the population. Why they are attacking hospitals and schools and everything else and the apartment buildings, and there's a reason for that. It's pretty obvious if you just look at the facts. Um, if, if you look at what is happening rather than what people are saying, it's just like politicians. Don't look, listen to what they say. Look at what they do they, because they're liars. And the state of Israel their propaganda, it is so in-your-face lying that it's like they have totally discredited themselves all over the world. I saw some stats the other day that the they, they've lost the propaganda war. Uh, like worldwide on social media, it is going like 15 to 1 against Israel because they're committing genocide that everybody can see, and they're, they're lying about it, and the lies are so utterly stupid— <laughs> And you just look at the pictures. They they show you a picture, and the picture makes what they're saying out to be, you know, it just contradicts what they're saying. Like all the evidence from October 7th where they're showing all these. <laughs> they have a, who was it? Was it from uh, BBC? They had a journalist out there, and the, they were giving him a tour. Of course, uh, uh, Franklin Graham, they gave him a tour. Now he's going to send aid to the Israelis. <laughs> Go <laughs> to the most wealthy countries in the Middle East. He's going to send aid to them. One of the most sophisticated countries in the world. He's going to send aid to them. Okay? Mm. <laughs> I think he's on the wrong side of the wall there. Um, what about to the Christians in Gaza? 
not many of them. I think there's somewhere like 7,000 or so Christians in Gaza. Uh, you know, before I forget, let me say that since I probably won't do a video on Thanksgiving, uh, I'll be doing other things like cooking pies and turkey and all that stuff. I'm the cook in the house. I'm the cook. Um, and a, a cook, you know, can't have two cooks in a kitchen. It doesn't work. Then I get testy with my wife. You're in my way. You're always in my way. She's always trying to do the dishes while I'm trying to cook. And it's like, no. Okay, uh, but what I was going to say is Thanksgiving is something, you know, I was thinking the other day about this and the the riches that we have, what to be thankful for, the riches we have in Christ. That's what we should be thankful for. The food and the, the housing and all this stuff we have, yeah, we have it in abundance in this country. Even the poor people have an abundance in the United States. And they're still, they still whine and grumble about everything. But the Christians in Gaza, which is hell on earth, this is a prob probably one of the worst places to be on the planet earth right now because of what? Israel is doing, uh, just trying to eliminate. Well, it's, you know, I'll mention what they're actually doing based on what they're doing, not what they're saying, because they are. Well, they've been actually saying it too. <laughs> it's like, really, you idiots, you idiots, you're committing de gen genocide and boasting about it. Not even the Nazis did that. Uh, they they tried to keep that hidden. You know, they didn't come out and boast about. What they're doing. Hmm. The Israelis are. So what, they're, they're cutting their own throats. That they are that the entire world is going to be hate in hating Israel. It's it's very hard. Looking at what I've been seeing over the last um, month and a half now, I guess. More than that. No, a month and a half. The uh what I it, it's very hard for me as a Christian, my flesh wants to hate. It really does. It's just like, oh, this, these people are so wicked. And they are truly wicked. Doing what they're doing is wickedness. But God can't send a son into the world to save sinners. And I have to keep that in mind. And I was and still am to a degree a sinner. Uh, Born-again Christians, technically, the Bible never calls Christ born-again Christians sinners. Sin still dwells in our mortal bodies, but we are a new creation, technically. But we, the present tense is one way of expressing what we were in the past, to emphasize it. Yes, and again, sin still dwells in us, so we are, we are fully capable of sinning. We're not fully, we can't abide in it, though. It, it is in our bodies. It's not in what we truly are. Uh, so it's it's our our what the Muslims call the greater jihad, the struggle with yourself, is what Christians experience. Uh, born again Christians, you find out that you're no longer in a struggle with God, but you are in a struggle with your own sinful flesh. And what do you do? You walk by faith. You just trust what Christ did on the cross and. Uh, then it is not, you realize there's, <laughs> just let him take care of it. He will sanctify you. People that try to sanctify themselves are really missing the boat. But uh, thankfulness that I would rather, truly, I would truly rather be a Christian in Gaza than being, say, Musk or, or Trump or uh, Bill Gates or any of these uh, unregenerate, filthy rich people that have so much money that they live out their fantasies in many ways. Like Musk with his project to put, what is it, 100 million people on Mars? Uh, yeah, I can get me there. <laughs> yeah, you, I, I can su probably suggest some people for you to, to put on Mars. Maybe you want to take Arnold Schwarzenegger up there and he can sort of be the tour guide. Um, you know, I actually, you know, on Musk, I think I commented in one of his videos, I, I, or a thing on on uh, on X, Twitter, 
And oh, oh, by the way, he's launched his own god now. He, he's uh, he does. I, I've been tweeting him, trying to let him know this is a very bad idea. Uh, you know, there's Chat GTP, which he was one of the founders of. Now he's launched his own version that's based at apparently it's very much connected to Twitter. And it's uh, XAI. I sort of wonder if he, one of the reasons he didn't buy a Twitter was to be a platform for this experiment. But it's called Grok. Sounds like the name of a demon to me. But it's, it's very, uh, it's the idea of modeling AI and then letting it loose on, it's supposed to have full access to Twitter, at least to the premium users. <sighs> It'll model itself. If you train AI with human behavior and human history, and especially if you train it using Twitter, what will you end? This thing is designed to be, quote, unquote, spicy, and it has a funny mode. And there's an example of his funniness, and his funniness is like the funniness of children. It is crude and... You know, crude. Let's just use the word crude. So you're going to deliberately allow this thing, this god you're producing, because this is what he will inquire of. He already does. He inquires of AI. He's looking for the truth from AI <laughs> at the grocery store because they, they use that now. I said, well, they were having problems. It was crowded and their automatic checkouts were... Or getting flagged because people put things in the wrong place and it thinks it's it's shoplifting and so the the poor w woman there that was trying to come around and punch the code in and review the video really quickly and um, she was getting really frustrated and I mentioned there was line was backing up and I mentioned to to a lady in front of me he said yeah that's AI uh, it's really AS. <laughs> Artificial stupidity. <laughs> she smiled. Yeah, we. I don't think the customers really know what it is, what's going on. But AI is, uh, well, probably end up being the image of the beast. You know, that's really where it's going. Uh, <clears throat> Now, what you know, if demons could, demons could uh, inhabit swine. At what point does the technology reach to a point where demons can inhabit the system? Because AI models itself on neural networks, and demons can inhabit. Say, hmm. Don't want to go too far with that because it's just speculation. Just speculation. Ah, oh, of course. Uh, 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 Musk, when they, I don't know how that project came out, hopefully it crashed and burned, was wanting to wire people directly into the Internet with a uh, brain implant. And they were working with swine because swine are sort of human-like in many ways. Also, they're one of the most, they're much more intelligent than dogs, but they're evil. I mean, they're bad. I know that. There are people that have pigs for pets, I don't know, but farm pigs. Or... No, you wouldn't want to fall down in the hog pen with a bunch of pigs. I mean, they might eat you. You had to be careful around those animals. Because they're they're savage. Of course, in in like in Texas and um, areas in the United States, they're being overrun with wild hogs. These are hogs that escaped and they're re returning to their natural uh, wild forms, and they are just a nuisance and dangerous. They destroy and rip everything up and multiply like mice. A litter of pigs could easily be, uh, you know, 8 to 12. 
All right, so uh, back on subject here. Where was the subject? Oh, thank. I was where I was going was thankfulness. Uh, is I would rather belong to Christ and be in Gaza than have all the riches of this world. He is so much beyond this garbage. Truly, I mean, truly, I would rather suffer. Uh, with especially with fellow, fellow believers in Gaza, I wouldn't necessarily want to be there alone, but they have all the riches of this world. It doesn't even compare. I mean, to have to have Christ is to have God. He that has the Son has the Father, and I literally can go for a walk with God, literally, and. Be in fellowship with God. Be in communication with God. And I don't mean that in the so-called charismatic sense. Because those people don't hear anything. <laughs> and it's obvious. We, uh, we just had, I just posted a video that I actually did last night on the latest charismatic scandal. Uh, Mike Bickle, who is a well-known name and one of the... Uh, uh, the if he's IHOP, and apparently the reports are there's t at least 20 women that have come forward with, with allegations of, of sexual misconduct over the last decades, multiple decades, going back before when IHOP, when Bickle founded IHOP. Before that, they had something in Kansas City called the Kansas City Prophets, and that was the... Uh, the demonic trio of uh, Bickle, of Paul Cain, the super false prophet, super false prophet, that's what he was, uh, and uh, um, Bob Jones. I mean, these people were scandalous, and people follow these devils. Uh, Paul Cain was supposedly this great, infallible prophet. He was the the, the epitome of the, the prophetic and apostolic movement. Uh, had been around for a long time, going back to uh, to some of the manifest sons of God and other nonsense in the old uh, Pentecostal history. And he died a, a homosexual and a alcoholic. And that says that's a lifestyle, but he was being adored and practically worshipped by the charismatics. See, this is not these this Bickle and IHOP is not mainline. This is like Redding, California, that kind of nonsense. It is the fringe of the fringe, but it really is center charismatic in many ways. It's not the old charismatic movement. I saw that. It would be like a group of people moving, meeting in a house someplace, and somebody might say say something in tongues, or somebody might have a word or something like that. But it was not like this. There were no apostles and prophets. And it was, you know, it was mostly harmless. But it would go in that direction, obviously. At the beginnings, it's, it's like uh, weeds in the garden, in the beginning, they don't really seem like much. But if you don't deal with them, they just fill everything. And so is the charismatic Pentecostal movement. It was built on a lie. And it's not something, well, you know, it's that little thing on the other side of the tracks. Well, that's not what it is. It dominates. It's hundreds and hundreds of millions of people uh, in Christianity are in bondage to this stuff. Biggest church in the United States, even uh, the milder signs you don't think of charismatic, but they are, Joel Osteen. Uh, his father was uh, Pentecostal, and Osteen is, well, he's a uh, respectable side of word of faith. He is uh, prosperity gospel, which is an utterly false gospel. Your best life now, that was the title of one of his books. If your best life is now, that means you're going to hell. <laughs> really? It is. If if this is your best life, it's, it's like uh, the post-millennialists. I have to look at this and say, if this is a millennium, 
I'm really, really, really disappointed. James White? If this is the millennium, Christ is ruling and reigning, Satan is locked up, we're ruling with him, I'm really, really, really disappointed. And these people complain about dispensationalists as being a a, uh, a, a gloomy thing. I said, post-millennialism is the most hopeless, gloomy, terrible thing there is. Talk about a pipe dream in spite of all the evidence. It's like, wait a minute. It's, it's like saying the, the thousand-year reign of the papacy as, as Christendom was, was the millennium kingdom. Really? Well, what about all the Christians, the, the real Christians, they martyred, butchered, in however fiendish way they could figure out to do it, burning them at the stake. And that includes the Protestants, too, with the, with the Baptists. The Anabaptists were Baptists. Anabaptists was just a label that, that you put on them in order to murder them, an excuse, using an old imperial law as an excuse. And the, Anab and the Anabaptists... The Baptists rejected that label because they didn't regard infant baptism as real baptism at all. And it's not. Baptism is a testimony that you have been saved. <sighs> You're identifying yourself with the church, with God's community. You're telling other people, yes, I belong to Christ, and this is my testimony of that. The, the actual water thing is just a Jewish tradition. As sort of based in the law. Uh, of when you bring when you brought things into the kingdom of God under the law, they had to be purified with either fire. Yeah, John the Baptist said, "I I I baptize in water; he'll baptize you in fire," re referring to Christ. But under the law of Moses, say uh, articles that came in from outside of Israel, they had to be cleansed, ritually cleansed with wa with fire. Or if they could not stand the heat, uh, they could be cleansed with water. And baptism is the cleansing. So when a when a Gentile became a Jew, which you could do, you could convert. Always could. There always it was because it's by faith, not by genetics. Always was, and the uh, baptism immersion ritual cleansing. That's where it comes from. Uh, Jews baptize all the time. Women are baptized every month in Judaism, Orthodox women. Um, at least those that are not too old or too young. And uh, so it's it was it was part of that. But Christians, we don't even understand where it came from. I mean, Gentiles, we lost a lot of understanding because we don't have those connections. Uh, especially to the Judaism of the first century. So, anyway, but but back to Thanksgiving. One thing, Thanksgiving Day, in some sense, I think it's it's silly because we're supposed to be thankful every day. It is is to me, it's like the Sabbath day. I I, I don't have a Sabbath. The Sabbath is trusting in Christ rather than trusting in my own righteousness. That's the Sabbath, the biblical Sabbath. And as Paul says, some some honor one day above the other, some honor in every all days alike. I'll go with that because of what it's supposed to represent. The, the Ten Commandments aren't Christians aren't under the Ten Commandments. We're not under law, we're under Christ. Why would you want something so worthless as a law? Because it has no power to save you. It has no power to give life. It only gives death. When you have Christ, which is the, the, the he is life. He is truth. He is salvation. Why would you want to turn back to the shadows, the temporary shadows of the law of Moses? Why would you want to put the law of Moses, the whole world, under the law of Moses? But yeah, we should be thankful for him, for Christ, for our salvation, for the gift 
of eternal life in Christ, the gift of so much, the gift of God himself. I really like what God said, to, told uh, Abraham when he promised himself. He said, he told, at one point he tells Abraham, I am your eternal great reward, exceedingly great reward. Uh, eternal, I, that was a conflation of mine. Your exceedingly great reward. God himself, to know him. And you could only know him through Christ. That's why Abraham rejoiced to see Jesus' day. Because, <clears throat> well, he couldn't come into the presence of God until Christ had died and risen from the dead. He needed his sins atoned for. Christ has atoned for the sins of the whole world. <clears throat> and that accomplished several things. And so, in a sense, Christ is, a, as the Scripture says, he's the Savior of all men, but especially of believers. So there are aspects of his atonement that apply to all creation. He bought all human beings out from underneath the curse. But as far as actually receiving the blessings of God in a special sense, that is those who believe. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. But even those that aren't in Christ receive some benefits from the cross. Having the, the potential of being saved is one of them. Because it's again God's purpose in Christ is to restore all things. Is that Colossians? Yes, I was reading that again the other day. And yeah, to to reconcile all things to Himself. God is in Christ reconciling everything to Himself, undoing the fall. He's in the process of undoing the fall, undoing what happened in the Garden of Eden. And that's one of the purposes for the millennium kingdom that comes after the return of Christ because you can't have the kingdom without the king present on earth. Augustine was biblically ignorant. He preferred his own thoughts. And he preferred Aristotle. <laughs> Which brings me back to what I actually came out here to do. And I was laying in bed, I woke up and was began to think about the eternal decree of all things. The thing that makes Calvinism Calvinism, really, that is what's unique about it, is the emphasis on the what's called they call the eternal decree of all things, which actually means all things exhaustively. Which has which is really if you think about it, no, this doesn't work. You have to hold these Calvinist doctrines by faith because they, the Bible doesn't support them. If you want to uh, demonstrate the, the falseness of Calvinism, just look in the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is probably the most authoritative statement of it, uh, especially in the, uh, the, uh, the attributes of God, when it talks about God. And simply look at their proof text, you know, the, the text that they put there that, that say the Bible says this, teaches this. And go back and actually read that in context and see if it actually is talking about what they say it's talking about. So, either these people are big, biblically ignorant. No, what really happened was, why, why these proof texts don't line up is because the Bible wasn't the source of their doctrine to start with. They were uh, the, uh, the Westminster um, Committee that was appointed by the... Uh, by the uh, uh, the Parliament, which was charged with coming up with a universal statement of faith for Scotland and England, and uh, so they did that. And then afterwards, they they submitted it to Parliament, and Parliament sent it back and said, "No, we want scriptural proof of this." So they had to after they had to try to paste on some scriptural proof. Uh, on the on the document that they had created that wasn't built on the scripture, <laughs> that is why the scriptural proofs don't actually agree with the content. They don't actually prove what they claim they prove, because they were afterthoughts. They were just instructed that they wanted scripture, and 
too bad. <laughs> it, didn't, it doesn't fit because it wasn't built on Scripture. It was built on tradition and philosophy. Uh, it's not totally, you know, not all of them are totally that way, but in particular areas like the, 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 the talking about God, it's uh, classical theism, classical monotheism, uh, the ph philosophical theism comes from Aristotle. It does not come from the Bible. And Aristotle, through people like Augustine and others, uh, brought that into Christianity. Uh, Augustine was a corrupter of Christianity. He was not, you know, the Roman Catholics say he was one of the doctors of the church. Yeah, one of the builders of Roman Catholicism is what he is, and not someone that Christians should listen to. Just because he says some true things doesn't mean it. The devil says some true things, which, you know, is this, uh, the foolishness of Christians, that so-called Bible believers that indiscriminately quote from the Scripture because it's all inspired of God. I mean, they have this really childish idea. So they'll like, every time I see a quote from Job, I have to go back and check because I know, I know what it's going to be. It's not going to be from where God is speaking in Job. It's always going to be from one of Job's friends, which were, which God pronounces as being teaching, saying false things. <laughs> so they'll quote from from the scripture where God identifies them as speaking false things about God, but people will quote from those very people as if it was God. <laughs> huh. We have problems in Christianity with Christians, including myself. But I was thinking about this eternal decree. Now, the thing about that, once you understand, it's not simply a decree of the fra framing the worlds, framing the context of everything that happens. No, that's not what it is. It is that God decreed everything in exhaustive detail, all things. But when you think about that, it's like, you mean he decreed the fall of Adam into sin? Yes, that's what they're saying. Calvin himself called that the dreadful or awful decree. But he believed God actually decreed Adam to sin. Adam had to sin because God decreed Adam to sin. All sin is decreed by God. Every vile action. What the Israelis are doing in, in Gaza according to the Calvinists, is decreed by God. Now, Luther was was even, um, perhaps even stronger of a, uh, a Calvinist than Calvin, as far as holding to the, the Augustinian. He was an Augustinian monk, so he held to these ideas also of God having decreed all things. No. Just, that doesn't mean God doesn't decree some things. Everything God has written, he has said. Everything God has, he himself has said is decreed. It's like God decreed that salvation would be by grace through faith in Christ. But Calvinists believe salvation is by the eternal decree. God chose, uh, before they were even created, some individuals to be saved and other individuals to be damned both for his glory. So what is the difference between a sinner, a lost sinner, and a saved saint? Nothing other than God arbitrarily said, this one's saved, that one's lost, before they even existed or did anything, based on misunderstanding of Scripture, misapplication of Scripture, not reading Scripture carefully in context. James White not reading the Greek carefully either, James White. <laughs> Do I have to lecture somebody? I, I, I'm not an... My Greek is barely functional. I mean, I've got the tools. I can decode it. But as far as reading it, well, no. I have to do it bit by bit by bit. But I can do that. as well as anyone, because their sources are the Scripture. 
Okay, it's like the lexicons. They they are based on how it's used in scripture. And with computers, I can look at every verse that uses the word and say, oh, Paul uses the word this way. That's exactly how you create a lexicon. We can just do it on the fly nowadays. But yeah, it's uh, but the eternal decree is what makes Calvinism Calvinism, and it is the as Calvin said, the awful decree of sin. Now it's not possible. I was, I was getting this morning when I was laying there. I was thinking, well, wait a minute. In some ways, my my brain is getting my mind is getting clearer as I get older. Other ways, it's not. But uh, wait a minute. The scripture says, for example, God is truth, right? The scripture says God is truth. And it says, literally says, God cannot lie. Why well, can't God lie? Because God is truth. His nature is truth. God cannot act contrary to his nature. Right? If God were to, if God is truth, if he lied, he would no longer be truth. He would self-destruct. You know, he can't. He can't on act. God is limited. He is not infinite and unlimited in all ways. God cannot lie. We can lie. God cannot lie. We can do things God can't. Because God is truth and God is good. We can sin. God can't do. God can't do what is evil. Morally evil. Sometimes the Bible uses uh, evil to mean calamities, like earthquakes, things like that. And God says, I do those things. But he does it for good reasons. He doesn't violate his moral character. These are just physical events that, from a person's point of view, it's calamitous. So if my house were to burn down, it would be, I would think, this is bad. But I could not blame God because God allows only good. God only does good. God is good, so he can only do good. Understand? Because that's his nature. God cannot violate his own nature. That should be pretty elementary. As long as your understanding of God's nature comes from Scripture rather than from uh, sinful human thinking like from Aristotle and Augustine. Augustine shouldn't be called a saint. <laughs> He's a corrupter of Christianity in many ways, many ways. And uh, his conversion was rather dicey. But uh, so if God is good, so if God is truth, therefore God cannot lie. This is explicitly stated in the scripture that God cannot lie and that God is truth. God is good. So can God do what is not good? Can God decree evil, moral evil? Can God decree what is not good? Of course not. Of course not. Because it would be God acting contrary to his own being, his own nature, and God cannot do that and be God. And Because he, God is holy and true. God is love. God is good. God is righteousness. What's right? Can God decree others do what is contrary to his nature? No. When God created all things, after he created the, after each day, he said, God looked and he saw it was good. And then he, when he finished with man, he said, who was created to be his own image. He says, he looked and God said, it is very good. And God rested on the seventh day. Very good. So God, all his creation, God himself pronounces it very good. So where does evil come from then? Well, God created beings that human beings, and one of the things that, for example, Calvinism in their uh, wisdom and confession of uh, faith says, God is most free. Well, let me point out that if God decreed everything, then God is bound by his own decree and he's not free at all. God decreed himself. If he decreed all things, uh, because he's no, he, and he's no longer free to act because it's all been exhaustively decreed. 
So you can't, how do you say he's most free? That's silly. Double talk. Very Orwellian. Be, long before Orwell. So, well, say, Satan is the kind of being that inspires that kind of thinking. That is, that, that just disrupts your mind um, deliberately. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> deliberately uh, corrupting our, our corrupting us. But so if, if God is good and God uh, everything that God does must be good also, and God cannot possibly decree what he says is bad, contrary to his goodness. Right? Pretty simple. So God can't decree evil. God can't decree, you see, people like James White, which is a, who is a hardcore Calvinist, um, when he's confronted with this in debates, he's, he's like, uh, there's a debate out there where uh, the, he's asked, you mean God decreed the rape of a child? And James White says, yes. And that is what gives it purpose which tells you something about how much Calvinism can twist your mind. So the purpose is what? To glorify God? How? How? See, the, you're, we, we can, uh, Satan can so twist our thinking that we think black is white and white is black. Light is darkness and darkness is light. And that part of Calvinism, like Calvinism, is like that. So where does evil come from? God made man free, because God is free. God, man, was made in His image. Man cannot be free. Man cannot be in the image of God, unless, well, I should say, man cannot be in the image of God unless man is free. Now, with the fall because much of, most of that image is lost, our freedom is mostly lost, too. We became slaves of sin. Why? What happened when we fell? We cut ourselves off. Adam cut himself off from God, which is from life and from goodness and from holiness, from all that God is. He cut himself off. That was the consequence of sin. He ruptured his relationship with God. Man is not designed to be a autonomous being that exists separate from God. We are designed to be the very temples of God. We are to be the dwelling place of God, to be the, the image of God. And when we cut ourselves off from God, we are are twisted and distorted and darkened because God's not in us. We can no longer function. And that's what sin is. It is being deprived of God's life in us. And when we're born again, that's no longer, that's no longer true. God is in us. But that could never happen prior to the cross. People in the Old Testament were not regenerate. Calvinists, they, David was not regenerate. Moses was not regenerate. Why? Because God could not possibly dwell in them. The Holy Spirit could not, in, the Holy Spirit would, would come upon people, but he would not dwell in them. He couldn't because of sin, that rupture between God and man, that, you know, God cannot, dwell together with evil, with what is contrary to him, because that violates himself. Man was no longer good. Man was no longer a suitable temple. The temple had to be cleansed. Had, uh, there had to be blood to cleanse the temple, to use the Old Testament sacrificial system as, a, as an illustration, which is what it is, just an illustration of what was to come in Christ. Christ had to die for the sins of the entire world for us to even have the possibility of being born again.
Otherwise, God could not inhabit us. We could not be born again. Because to be born again, one of the promises is, is not only does God do a lot of work in us, give us a new heart and a new spirit, and write his, his will, his commandments on our heart, but he gives us his own spirit. We become the habitation, the temples, literally the temples of God. Literally the temples of God. Which is why I say I can literally go with a walk, for a walk with God because he is in me. I can't go for a walk without him. It's just a matter of whether I'm conscious of his presence through faith. I know he is with me, but when I'm, when I'm when out taking a walk with him, my mind is on him. That's that's what I mean. It's not a there's not a change in state at all. I don't literally come into his presence. His presence is in me. My mind comes into that reality. And I focus on that. I focus on him. And we have a conversation of sorts. God does not need to use language. So it is uh, he illumines us. He gives us understanding. When somebody says, God said this, it's like, that should raise a little bit of a red flag uh, because that's not really how God communicates with his children. As uh, Jesus, uh, after his resurrection, he opened the minds of his disciples to understand. That's what he does. He gives us understanding. He has spoken sufficiently in the Scripture. We don't need new revelation. Christ is the, you can't have new revelation beyond Christ anyway. If Christ is in you, you have all of God. In him is the Father. and The Father in Christ and Christ in us. You cannot have any other revelation of God because he is the fullness of the revelation of God. That's why any other prophets that come along, like Muhammad, <laughs> the Quran compared to to Christ. Oh man, that is so. That is so. Uh, to eat to think that Muhammad was a truly a prophet of God is. Well, he he proclaimed the one God. That's about as close as he got. You know, he so he's better than Joseph Smith. But no, I mean. It's like Moses. Moses is, is not even comparable to Christ at all. They are they're not even close because they're completely different categories. Uh, Moses is an unregenerate sinner. Moses had to wait for the atonement of Christ too. Moses couldn't even get into the promised land. You know, Jesus said, Talking about uh, uh, John the Baptist, he said, John the Baptist is the greatest of all prophets. Nevertheless, he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. What did he mean? Well, I had a Baptist pastor that said, uh, well, that, what that means is, is that the, the, the person that is the least, as in the most humble, is greater than John? No, no, he didn't understand the scripture either very well. Neither did I at that time. We were both about the same age, too. Yeah, he was in a bad situation. <laughs> However, the real, what Jesus actually meant by that is because in the new covenant, to be in the new covenant is to be in the kingdom of God. The promises are so much greater. You are a new creation. You have a new heart, a new spirit. We have the mind of Christ. And we have Christ himself dwelling in us through his spirit. We are the temples of God, very literally. We are the light of the world, very literally, because Christ is in us. And therefore, he that is least in the kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, those who are born again, as Jesus said, you must be born again to see the kingdom. You must be born of the Spirit to be in the kingdom. He that is in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist was a mere prophet before the new covenant came into place. 
they had to wait for Christ to die and to rise. Which brings up another interesting possibility that I dare not go into right now, but that this is, uh, this is what we have to be thankful for. Not one day a year, but every day. This is why I can say I would rather be with Christ in Gaza than be without him and have all the riches of the world. Well, he himself said, what does it profit man to, to gain the entire world and forfeit his own soul? Absolutely true. And look at all the people, including the people that call themselves Christians, and they're, they're chasing after the things of this world. They're chasing after money, power. They're fools. They're fools. They're fools. They're forfeiting the real riches for, for things that are passing away. They could pass away at any second. It's like the American dollar. Why would you put any hope in that roll of toilet paper? Because that's all it is. It's not even paper most of the time nowadays. To put confidence in that. I see the, what is it, Argentine? The Argentinians? That the, their newly elected president wants to change their currency from what, what, whatever it is, I don't know if it's a peso or whatever they call it down there, to the dollar. Well, uh, now their currency could be even worse than the dollar, but, I mean, really? The dollar is, is sound? No, it's not. It's not. Uh, so you're going to tie yourself to this sinking ship called the United States of America. Not a good choice. Not a good choice. But yeah, you have people, this world is it's like the people like Musk and, and Gates and and all these Uber Zuckerberg and all these Uber Uber billionaires. What do they have? Nothing but dust. They're hopeless. Musk they're creating his 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 own god called Grok? Really? What a fool. What a fool. Who knows? Maybe maybe his art AI will actually learn the Bible and inform Musk that he needs salvation and needs to turn to Christ. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a a, a flip? Grok preaches the gospel. It's a possibility. It's, it's based on the nature of AI, yeah. So if, if Musk asks Grok, how shall I be saved? Grok might actually tell him. We can hope. But I think a living witness who is actually saved is probably a better way to communicate that with with Mr. Musk. Uh, I'm not sure he listens. Well, that's a problem, too, because the unbelievers, uh, which is the vast majority of people in the United States and everywhere, um, they're... The Holy Spirit has to open your eyes and open your ears because otherwise you're just not interested. You're, not, you're, you're so in love with this world. Although sometimes uh, calamities can shake you enough to begin to think about things, too. And I think that's God's purpose in calamities, is to, to uh, shake us because we get so comfortable in some things that we need to be disturbed to the point we begin to, you know, like awakening someone from their slumber is what we're, he's really doing in those things. Because he's really, he, he, God says, I do these things as far as natural calamities, hurricanes, earthquakes, things like that. Why? For good purpose. Because God is good. He can't do anything evil. He works good. And God, the, the, the greatest good of all is for human beings to be restored to a proper relationship with God. Again, back to the, the Calvinist 
the, the mark of Calvinism is the eternal decree of all things, which is, which is slanderous. Based on human reasoning, it's not based on Scripture. The Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, the Bible doesn't teach a lot of things that they claim it teaches. I sometimes, did Calvin ever know Christ? I don't know. I don't know. I think... And people can know him in different degrees. Now, all these, all like all these reformers, they're pretty young guys. I mean, they were they were fresh out of Roman Catholicism, usually running for their lives, and uh, they did not have the luxury of sitting here surrounded by, you know, all kinds of information and stacks of Bibles and. Uh, computer technology that I can can I always I don't hardly ever read the Bible oh, well when I do work I do it on the computer because at my fingertips I have so much information about the scriptures I mean I can look at even though I'm not uh, trained in Greek I can I know enough about languages having studied some and uh, I can understand the you know I've got I can look at Greek and pretty much read it almost but as far as the syntax and everything else, computer assistance just breaks it down. And there's some pitfalls that you have to watch out for. You don't want to be dogmatic unless you do some careful research because you can have same endings and the computer can tell you it's this and it's not necessarily that. So I found that out. But nevertheless, I've got all this information uh, available at my fingertips. I don't know how many gigabytes I've got. I don't spend my time wasting on people like the Puritans or stuff like that. But, or the church fathers. I have access to that stuff. I find no reason to look at it because they're not reliable sources. I've looked at them. I said, no, these people are not people I want to follow. But why follow dead men when you can have, when the living Lord dwells in you? Christianity is Christ which is the most powerful and comprehensive statement I can make. Christianity is Christ. Just like God is love, Christianity is Christ. Christ.